Well, there's a time now for the preaching of the word, the time that we come to hear the preaching of the word. And what a privilege of mine to, to have my, my uh, daughter-in-law, Ashley, to come and bring the word of God. And Ashley, take your liberty and preach away. Good morning, everybody. All right, I got the computer. All right, sounds fantastic. So it's already connected? Okay, let me get all set up right here. All right, figure out which hand to hold and which hand the notes for. <laughs> all right, well, welcome. Good morning. Glad everybody's here. We are going to start off with a question for everybody, okay? So, um, here is the question. I got to do the presentation button. That would help, wouldn't it? Okay, let's try this question again. At a Christian Pentecostal college, which was considered offensive? Was it A, a woman preaching, <laughs> um, B, evangelism, or C, speaking in tongues? Oh. Okay, all right, let's talk about it. What do you think it is? A. You think it's a woman preaching? You think it's speaking in tongues? You think it's a, you would say C? <laughs> Only one. Okay, here's the thing. All right, so here's, here's the thing. These things are probably considered offensive, depending on which college you go to. But the answer, B, evangelism. I know, I was, I was very shocked by this too. So it was evangelism. It was that they were talking specifically about missions. And it was a major Pentecostal denomination. They were visiting a Christian college, and they had given their presentation on the gospel and what they were doing to plant churches and to convert people to Christianity. And toward the end, they were doing a Q&A, and the students were like, um, we think it's unethical to send out missionaries to convert these people. I'm going to quote from the article. It says, the students objected that Christianity's exclusivist claims reek of Western privilege and neocolonialism. These young people saw compassionate works as commendable, but they opposed the idea of missionaries making converts. Now, those are a lot of kind of big words, very like trendy like words. But basically what they're saying is, listen, you can do the good things, but making converts, like, no, you shouldn't do that at all. And I, I, I thought that was terrible. Like, how in the world, like, what part of your Bible did you miss? Like, I know what part, actually, <laughs> a big part of it. Now, here's the thing. What's worse, once again, this has happened at a Christian college. What's even worse is these, these students were enrolled in a class on missions as part of training for the ministry. These are your future pastors, your future worship leaders, your future, all those things. They don't think it's ethical to evangelize. And I was, I, I was really blown away by that. Like, that was very shocking. And it's like, okay, clearly these guys, they say they feel called to ministry enough to go to a Christian college and enroll. But they do not understand the power of the gospel. Because if they truly understood the life-changing power of the gospel, then they would be like, no, we have to evangelize. We have to set the people free. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about today, is the power of the gospel. So we are going to be in the book of Colossians all day. Um, all the scripture is going to be on the screen because there's a lot of it. And um, that if you want to look it up on your own, you're welcome to. So we are going to get started. Um, believe it or not, I'm going to be doing this as an acrostic. So each letter of the word gospel is going to stand for something that the power of the gospel, uh, the gospel gives us the power to do. So let's get started. Letter G, the, uh, the gospel gives us the power to grow and to bear fruit. So we're going to read Colossians 1, 5 through 6. It says, your faith and love have arisen from the hope laid up for you in heaven, which you have heard about in the message of the tru truth. The gospel ha that has come to you, just as in the entire world, this gospel is bearing fruit and, and growing. So it has also been bearing fruit and growing among you from the first day you heard it and understood, heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. Now, my kiddos, we've, we've talked about this before. See if you remember, what does gospel mean? Do you remember? Yes, ma'am. Sort of. Caleb, you remember? Is the good news, right? And what is the good news of the gospel? He came from heaven to earth, showed the way, right? <laughs> That's right, that Jesus came and he died on the cross. And I think sometimes when you hear about the gospel, you think of that initial evangelism point. Like, this person did not know God. 
I, you know, share the gospel with them. Now they're changed. The end. They move on to maturity. But really, when you understand what the gospel has, the power that it has, it applies not only to somebody who's been saved for 10 minutes, but for someone who's been saved 10 years and 30 years and 50 years on until they meet the Lord. Okay. The gospel is so powerful. And here's the thing in your relationship with God, we are meant to grow and to bear fruit. We don't top out. Okay. There is not some invisible ceiling keeping us like, sorry, you can't go that far. Okay, well, Billy Graham was here. You can't get above Billy Graham now, you know, or whoever, fill in the blank. You don't top out with the gospel. The gospel gives us power to grow, gives us power to, to bear much fruit. And the gospel will do that as well. It itself will continue to grow. We're going to look at what Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, 14 through 15. He says, Timothy, do not neglect the spiritual gift you received through the prophecy spoken over you when the elders of the church laid their hands on you. Give your complete attention to these matters. What matters? The spiritual gifts inside of him. Throw yourself into your task. There's another translation that says be absorbed in it. Throw yourself into your task so that everyone will see your progress. So not only will the gospel spread throughout the earth and grow, as Christians, we are meant to continue to grow. And even as Paul told Timothy as his pastor, he's like, hey, Timothy, you have gifts inside of you. You have these talents that the Lord has given you. Don't neglect it. Don't just let it fall off the side, but instead absorb yourself with them. Throw yourself into it. Make that the thing that you are most passionate about, not just for Timothy, but even so that the people around him can see his progress. Sometimes we have that, like that false humility where we're like, we don't want people to see. It's important not to be prideful, but we have to remember we are also to be on display, right? That God wants us to be witnesses. So sometimes that, that's okay. So um, another verse I've mentioned is 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9. It says, the word of God cannot be changed. So that gospel, the gospel that's going around the world, it can't be stopped. It doesn't matter if it is in Iran, which Iran, they are the fastest growing uh, Christian country right now, or uh, the country that has Christianity inside of it is growing at the fastest rate at 20% per year, okay? Because the word of God can't be changed, okay? The gospel cannot be stopped. It does not matter if, if they are killing everybody, just like Herod thought he wiped out all the babies, okay? There is still one. <laughs> and the word of God cannot be chained, and the gospel cannot be stopped. Um, also, in John 14, 4 and 5, it says, When we, as Christians, when we are connected to the true vine, we are to bear much fruit. So that we have so many verses in the Bible, and there's more than this, I just didn't want to list them all, <laughs> that talks about how important it is for us to grow and to bear fruit. We aren't meant to just to stay stagnant, to stay at the very base level. We're meant to go upwards. The other thing that this reminds me of is uh, the story that Jesus told about those servants, right? He gave one servant 10, uh, oh, I forget what the amount was. Yeah, 10, one five, and one one talent, right? And so what did the two with the 10 and the five do? They did something with it, right? They did. They weren't lazy with it. They went and they threw their self into the task. They saw the progress. They saw things get built up. What did the wicked, lazy servant do? He buried it. Why? Do you guys know why he buried it? He was afraid. He, he was afraid. And then the rebuke he gets was, you wicked and you lazy servant. Right? And so to me, I feel like that is kind of the antithesis of this verse when Paul's like, hey, listen, throw yourself into it. And then also in mind, keeping in mind, like I said, that wicked servant, it's like, God, I don't want to be that wicked servant. I want to take every single gift you have put inside of me, every opportunity you have put inside of me, and I want to be the five and ten talent guy, oh, girl, because <laughs> I'm a girl. Um, I want to be the five and the ten talent girl. I want to make sure that I am putting my work into this, not because of me, but because you have given this to me. You have entrusted me, just like the master entrusted his servants with that. He trusted them. God has entrusted us with his gospel, with this good news, and it is to grow and it is to bear fruit. Um, so once again, there are numerous references, and in fact, there are also passages that say there's a big, big problem if we stop bearing fruit. Further on in that chapter, in John, it even says that he prunes those who do not bear fruit. And as my fellow gardener can attest, that's what you do. When things aren't, aren't working right, you got to prune it, you got to take it out. So um, go back one slide here, back to this verse 6, the first one we read. At the end of verse 6, it says here, uh, among you from the first day you heard it and understood the grace of God. There is actually a lot of growing that comes from understanding. Understanding is very, very, very important. So we're going to uh, see here. So when it comes to understanding, you might be thinking, but how? What understanding do I need? How do I get that understanding so I can bear fruit? 
Colossians 1, 9 through 10 gives us the answer. It says, so we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord and your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. So you got, you got grow, right? You got producing good fruit. The same things that I was talking about that in those first couple of verses. So that understanding comes through prayer. How do you know God's will for your life so that you can bear fruit? You have to pray about it, right? And in this case, Paul was praying for the church in Colossians. But we too, whether we pray for ourselves or whether we pray for each other, whatever the case may be, um, that's what we do. You, you get this understanding by, by praying and then by standing firm and you will know the knowledge of his will. And that's what you do to bear fruit. So with each of these points, there's actually going to be an action point um, at the end for you to kind of something to act on. So action point number one for letter G, ask to God, you need to pray and ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will so you can bear fruit. You may be at a point, and like my kids, you guys are young, right? It's to, you, are per, you are still eligible for this, to pray and ask God his will for your life, okay? As adults, it is still right for us to pray and to ask God his will for our lives, okay? As adults older than me, see, it was very nice how I said that. <laughs> no. It is still the same thing, ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will. There are some of those very basic things as Christians we know, right? It's like we're all responsible for, the, for that kingdom um, mandate to go and to spread the gospel. But there are other things specifically that God has you on this earth to complete. And it's important for us to say, like, Lord, what is your will for me? I know, obviously, I'm to love my neighbor as myself. I know that I need to be in church. I know I need to, to share the gospel. I, need, I know I need to take care of my kids. But from specifically, God, what did you create me for? And that is something, let's focus on that this week. One thing we focus on is ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will. Why? So you can bear fruit. And the Bible has a lot to say about the prayers that God answers. And, uh, and it says that when we pray according to his will, that he will answer us. So we can be confident in this prayer, knowing, because it's like, well, he wants us to bear fruit. So if we ask him, what is his will? Well, Lord, what's your will for me so I can bear fruit? He's not going to be like, nah. I just want you to guess. No, he's not going to do that. He's going to answer because he, he is going to answer that. So, all right. So that is letter G. All right. This is the next one. Letter O. The power to transfer us out of the power of darkness and into the kingdom of his son. That is for us. Colossians 1, 13 and 14. He delivered us from the power of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of the son he loves and whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sin. So the power of the gospel takes us out of the power of darkness. It doesn't have a hold on us. And to me, that's really, really exciting. Uh, I don't think sometimes we realize our spiritual state before Christ. Caleb, when I was nine years old, that's when I got saved. Okay, at nine years old, have you done any major, committed any major crimes? No, right? <laughs> haven't killed anybody, haven't, yeah. I mean, the, you've done pretty good. If you look at the Ten Commandments, you're doing okay, right? Um, so as, as a nine-year-old, it was like, okay, I haven't killed anybody. I may have lied a time or two. Okay, sometimes I give my mom a really bad look, you know. But there's a whole other host of things that I thought I haven't, haven't done. Um, but that doesn't make me any less lost. So I don't think, think about, too, is like, what was your condition before Christ? Maybe it was dramatic, or maybe it was like me. It wasn't that dramatic. But no matter what, we were all from the same camp. We were all in the power of darkness. We were in that kingdom. We were under that power, okay? And when, the, when we came to know the Lord through the gospel, it was the power to transfer us out from underneath that power of darkness. So there are so many verses for this point. So I have some that are just listed, but we are going to read through a few. So what, because what Christ accomplished on the cross, it changed everything, right? So Old Testament, what did they have to kill for the atonement of sin? They had, yeah, they had the sheep, the goats, all these different things. Christ's blood was so much more than those things. And it was, uh, it was more than enough, and it was far superior to those things. All right, let's read some more. Colossians 1, 21 to 23. And you were at one time strangers and enemies in your minds, as expressed through evil deeds. Now, as, as a nine-year-old, I didn't feel like an enemy. But because of the nature within me, I was. But now he, Jesus, reconciled you by his physical body through death 
to present you holy without blemish and blameless before him. And here's a big if. If indeed you remain in the faith, established and firm, without shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard. So I, I think that that verse it, it is really nice because it shows what you were and then what, his, what, the cross, what the gospel did. Let's read another one. Ephesians 1, this is a long passage, 1, 17 through 23. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, will give you spiritual wisdom and revelation and your growing knowledge of him. Since the eyes of your heart have been enlightened so that you can know what is the hope of his calling, what is the wealth of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the incomparable greatness of his power toward us who believe, as displayed in the exercise of his immense strength. So this power, about to start talking about the power that, that has happened, this power he exercised in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above, above every rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the age to come. And God put all things under Christ's feet. And that's where most churches stop reading that verse and gave him to the church as the head over all things. Now the church is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So where are all these authorities and the powers and the dominions? Where are they? They are where? Under Christ's feet. Sorry, Gary, you know that answer. Under Christ's feet. Who are we a part of? Are we Christ's body? Yeah. So where are those things? They're under our feet. We can't be a part of Christ's body and then those things still be above us. Because if we are in Christ, that means those things, those powers, the dominions, the authorities, those things are under our feet. They have no control over us, nothing, because they are under our feet. All right, Colossians 2, 13 through 15. And even though you are dead in your transgressions and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he nevertheless made you alive with him, having forgiven all your transgressions. He has destroyed what was against us, a certificate of indebtedness expressed in, a, in decrees opposed to us. He has taken it away by kneeling it to the cross, disarming the rulers and authorities. He has made a public disgrace of them, triumphing them, um, triumphing over them by the cross. Okay, that's another one saying that basically the exact same thing, that those things that were um, those rulers, the authorities, he made a public disgrace out of them. It wasn't like, phew, he barely made it all out of that fight. Like, you know, watching the games yesterday that were like nail biters, like phew, they barely made it. It wasn't a fight like that. It was, I mean, like he, he publicly disgraced them, right? And he triumphed over them and they are under his feet. So they are under our feet because we too are connected to Christ. To Christ. And so here are some additional verses if you guys wanna write those down. Um, that you guys can look at later. And really, it's just explaining that point even further, that God gives the power of the gospel is the power that transfers us out of out of the power of darkness. So, um, let's see, yeah, that's all for those. So Christ is enough. So what he did on the cross, it made us new creations. So we are not bound by the things we used to be bound to. We are seated with Christ. All right, action point for this one. Know what the cross of Christ did for you and your standing. Uh, we have a, a generation of, of, very, of Christians who don't really understand what the Bible says and what salvation has done for them. They think, I got my fire insurance, right? Okay, that's what they called it growing up. Was it great? I got saved. No, I'm not going to the hot place. I'm good. But it's so much more than just not going there, right? So in your time this week, um, figure out what Christ did for you in your standing. Another one for this point. Learn, which goes along with it. Learn the benefits of salvation in the Holy Spirit. God didn't didn't leave you powerless, right? He sent the Holy Spirit so you can be you too could be endued with power. And um, some really good uh, verse uh, verses books of the Bible to help with that. Make a point over the next couple weeks to read through Romans and Ephesians. Those two books of the Bible, I mean, they're all really good. But those two in particular really detail your life before Christ, how sin has no power over you, how you are new creations, and they can really help you figure out what exactly the cross of Christ is all about. All right, next letter. Letter S. Yes. Oh. That one? That one? Okay. Go for it. No, that's not, not a problem. 
All right, we good to get the last one? Romans, Ephesians. Okay. Letter S, the power of the secret. Everybody loves a good secret, right? When you have that secret, right? At Christmas time right now, we have lots of secrets, okay? I know, right? All right, well, here's the thing. Colossians talks about a secret, too. It's Colossians 1.27. For God wanted them to know that the riches and glory of Christ are for you Gentiles, too. And this is the secret. Christ lives in you. This gives you assurance of sharing his glory. If you read it in different translations, they'll say, this is your hope of glory. I like that one better because I've always heard it. But so S is the power of the secret. Christ in you. That is the secret. How do you have so much joy? Things aren't going great. Well, it's because Christ is in me. How do you have so much peace? Everything's in turmoil. Every gas prices are rising. Food prices are rising. Everything's rising. Oh, it's Christ in me. How do you have so much patience with your kids and your job and this and that, whatever the case may be? Oh, it's easy. It's Christ who lives in me. Because the Bible says that if God is for us, what's the verse say? Who can be against us? Who? Who's going to be against us? Nobody. Why? Because where are they? Where are they? They're under our feet because they can't be against us because they would be, yeah, because they're under our feet. We're on top of them. Um, So because Christ is in us, we can face anything. He is our hope of glory. How great is that? Like, it, it doesn't matter if you've been saved like seven minutes or 50 years, knowing that you have Christ living inside of you, like that gives us the confidence to face anything, to face stuff at your job, face stuff with your family, whatever it is, that gives us this confidence. So, a few more things that the Bible says. The Bible says that we go from glory to glory. Okay, and that's 2 Corinthians 3.18. The Bible says that we are going from strength to strength. And the Bible says that we have the victory through Christ. And why is that? Because of the secret. And that secret is Christ in us. Because he is with us, we can face anything. Even if life is not going that great right now, okay? Even if you're in that situation, remember, Christ is in you. He is our hope of glory. So that, that to me, gives me such great encouragement because it, it, it doesn't matter the situation. It doesn't, if I'm going through something, that's a rough patch, okay? It doesn't take the secret away from me. The secret is within me no matter where I go. No matter what I do, the secret is with me, and that is Christ who is in me. All right, am I good to go to the next slide? Okay. All right, action point for this one. Do, sorry, do something practical to remind yourself that Christ is in you. And with that, you can conquer anything. So when I say practical, I mean, you know, write yourself a note. Get a dry erase marker and write it on your mirror in the bathroom. Um, You know, do something, a reminder on your phone. Do something to remind yourself that Christ is in you. You know, if you have a certain time of day that you tend to notice you're just a little bit off, you know, like if it's the afternoon slump and you need a reminder, well then set yourself an alarm for 2.30 in the afternoon to remind yourself that, hey, I have the secret inside of me and the secret is Christ is in me. So give yourself something practical. Do something to remind yourself that Christ is in you. All right, another thing. Um, When you get time, look up Rick Renner. I forgot my other quotation mark. Rick Renner, glory to glory. (laughs) I knew there was one that I forgot. Thank you. (laughs) Uh, Rick Renner, glory to glory. Um, I thought about reading it. I thought about showing a clip of it, but um, I want you to look it up in your own time. He talks about that verse in 2 Corinthians that says that we go from glory to glory. And in essence, what do you do if you're in a mess right now? That doesn't feel very glorious. So when you get a chance, look, look at that. All right, next letter. Halfway through the word. G-O-S, we are in letter P. The power against false philosophies. Okay, so we are moving on to Colossians chapter 2 now. So be careful not to allow anyone to captivate you through an empty, deceitful philosophy that is according to human traditions and to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. For in him, all the fullness of deity, or all the fullness of God, lives in bodily form. And you have been filled in him, who is the head over every ruler and every authority. And here, that echoes that same thing that we have already been talking about, that that we are in Christ, 
and he is the head over all of those things. So that, that just kind of echoes that. So anyway, this verse is talking about these empty, deceitful philosophies. And, um, and false teachings, false philosophies, it's nothing new. I mean, you can go back to the Old Testament. What was it like? I think it was Abinadab and Abihu who had like the strange fire. I think that was their names. Okay. Those were some false ideas then. And then if you read through the New Testament, you're going to see things like, hey, listen, watch out for false teachers. You're going to hear about the Nicolaitans. You're going to read about the Gnostic gospel, all these words that we don't really know what they mean because we have our, our own versions of that now. Right. And, and even if you fast forward, think about the 1500s. We're all experts in the 1500s, right? <laughs> That's what I thought. OK, <laughs> yeah. 1500s. Think about Martin Luther. Martin Luther, he was confronting some false teachings from the Catholic Church. Right. And then even to fast forward, even through that, even to the 1900s, it's easy. It's easy thinking about those things and thinking like, oh, the 1900s, Billy Graham's time, that must have been so easy for him to share the gospel. I just read a really thick autobiography of his, and you wouldn't believe some of the things they had to deal with when it came to false teachings and some of the same things that we're dealing with now um, and that they were having to, to come against. And so those things, false philosophies, they're not new. They have different names. We don't walk around talking about the Nicolaitans and the, all these things now. Right? But we have our own stuff that we have to deal with that are false teachings. And the, the pattern is the same. People or institutions, even within the, the churches sometimes, they'll have like a kernel of truth, right? Like with the Catholics and having the indulgences in Martin Luther's times. Like, yeah, you need to make your sins right. But they went so far as to say, but you can pay us to make those sins right. So it's based on the kernel of truth. But then as you learn more and more and more, then you realize it stops being truthful and instead they rely on twisting your emotions and like work trying to work into your logic and twist your emotions and they twist the scripture and it and it is a false teaching but because it sounds right at the beginning because it, you have been captivated through things you don't realize it until it's like it's too late now i think it's easy for us to say like listen i know i'm not going to go down to the witchcraft store down there and you know buy anything right I know that one, but so I'm good. But even in the church, sometimes it's important to know that what we believe is based on the word of God. And that's why knowing the gospel and knowing what Christ did on the cross, that's why it's so important, which brings to me to mine and Johnny's favorite topic, discipleship. <laughs> um, how did Paul come against these philosophies? What did he, what was he telling everybody to do? He, he was teaching them. He was teaching them the gospel. He's going through the whole story, teaching them everything. How did Luther come against all those strange teachings of the Catholic Church? He got a hammer and he got a nail and a really long piece of paper and he nailed those theses to the, to, to the door of the castle. And then he made sure that the, that the Bible was um, printed in a language that his people could understand. Because when they could understand, that goes way back to chapter one, when they understood, they could say, you know what? I don't have to pay money for my sins. And it's really, really silly to think that I can spring my, you know, my grandfather from hell if I pay the church enough money for that. They realized that those things were wrong. And so that, and even for Billy Graham, um, how did he come against the things in his era? What was he known for? For preaching the gospel everywhere he went. And he would have these meetings and he would have trainings for pastors and all these different things. So what should we do in our time to come against these things, people? Teach people. Preach the gospel and then teach people. Do exactly what the Great Commission tells us to do. Preach the gospel and then make disciples. So the word of God is powerful. It gives us the power over sin. It gives us the power of, to walk in victory. And when we teach the word, it quiets all the naysayers because the word works. All right, let's go to the next verse. Uh, Colossians 2, 16 through 18. So don't let anyone condemn you for what you eat or drink or for not celebrating certain holy days or new moon ceremonies or Sabbaths. For these rules are only shadows of the reality to come. And Christ himself is that reality. Don't let anyone condemn you by insisting on pious self-denial or the worship of angels, saying they've had visions about these things. So you can argue about all these other extra things in the Bible, right? That's what has split up denominations and all sort of stuff. But really, it comes down to, and Christ himself is that reality. When you know what the word says, and you stand on the word, people can condemn you for this, that, or the other. But if you stand on the word, then that, you have nothing to worry about. 
because Christ is your reality. He is the one that you listen to. It doesn't matter if, if it sounds so convincing, whatever the, the, the philosophy may be. If you can't show in the word where it is, then then stand uh, stand on the word. Um, and which our next verse, Colossians 2, 6 and 7. Therefore, just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him and firm in your faith, just as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. So when we are in the word, when we're reading the Bible, just like Pastor was saying this morning, you know, you're having your devotions, you're worshiping, you're praying. When you're doing those things, that is sending your roots down, just like in the garden. You start off with that baby plant, but those roots grow down and down and down. And over time, it becomes a strong, vibrant plant, right? It doesn't matter some of the other things that are going on around the plant. It doesn't say, oh, I think I want to be a cucumber plant. That cucumber plant's looking good. I think I want to do that. No, it knows I'm a tomato plant. I'm going to produce tomatoes. And so it stays rooted. It stays built up and it's firm because it knows who it is. And for us believers, we have the same call. We will not get captivated by anything that sounds, you know, attractive as long as we are rooted and built in him. And for us, we may not be captivated by those things now, but we may talk to other people who are. And that's why we need to know what we believe. So um, there are a lot of teachings in the church sometimes now that are not accurate, that are taught on a regular basis. And how do I know? Because there's an opposing side. <laughs> so it's like one denomination believes this, the other side believes this, and you have this and that. Um, they both can't be right. And some of these things, they're not heretical. It's not like, yeah, I mean, it's not these big points, but it's, um, they just may not be as biblically supported. I personally ran into this when I switched from Baptist theology to Pentecostal theology. Um, I'm not saying that Baptists are a bunch of false teachers. I don't mean it that way at all. It's just, um, you know, for them, the way that they interpreted those scriptures was very different from the way that, uh, Pentecostals do, um, but it was really, really hard because I grew up that way. The, you know, 90, I would say probably 95% of my family is Baptist. And then I had some friends who were Pentecostal. Um, I had a grandparent who was Pentecostal. And so trying to figure out which way was right was so hard. Nowadays, where do we go if we can't find information? We check on Google and YouTube and social media. Okay, right? It's like, why did you just go look at that? Go see, watch a video is, you know, are those gifts of spirit for today? That was in MySpace days. You couldn't get on MySpace and ask your top 10 friends, like, <laughs> I know, right? Like, hey, what do you believe about speaking in tongues? You know, what do you believe about all these different things? Um, so, oh, you do, absolutely. <laughs> that, and that's the thing. It's like, that, that's what's going to actually be my next point. <laughs> Um, that YouTube and social media, like that was really getting started. So there was no support. So it's like, I had to ask people on both sides and I had to go back to the word and I had to really say, all right, Lord, what, uh, what is the truth? You know, how do I interpret this? I had, I feel like I'm going to turn, almost turn my back on my family if I change denominations, but on the same time, I'll read your word. And this is what I'm reading here too. So, um, but because I went through that. I know what I believe about those matters. I can point you into the scriptures. Hey, this is why I believe the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for today. This is why I believe, you know, on down the list, I've had the experience, but I've also ha I have also have the word to back it up. Um, and that is extremely, extremely important. So, because once again, you don't know who you're talking to. And because of YouTube and Google, we are seeing, I feel like, a, just a proliferation of false philosophies flying out there today. Anybody with a camera can get on YouTube, right? You know, we may have a new video come out soon ourselves, but you know, anybody can be on there. And you, you don't know if those 2 million views came because that guy was dead wrong and all these friends were like, hey, listen to this bozo. Or if it got 2 million views because he was right, it was so powerful. So that's why you have to know what the word says, what leads us to the action point for, for letter P. Know what you believe and why. Get a notebook and a pen or a computer if you're, you know, yeah. Uh, get a notebook and pen and write down some key scriptures that put a footing on your faith. You can also like some look online. Be careful with that, but yes, you can look online because your faith, it, you need to have a footing on that so that when, if somebody does come and tries to condemn you, well, you believe this or you don't believe that, you can say, hey, I, yes, I understand, but this is what the Bible says. All right, almost done. Two more points. Letter E, the power to escape 
and the power to exhort. We're going to talk about escaping first. Colossians 3, 5 to 10. So put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. You used to do these things when your life was still a part of this world. But now is the time to get rid of anger and rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn, uh, as you learn to know your Creator and to become like Him. So one amazing benefit of the power of the gospel is the power to escape sin. Okay, as, as believers, and I know all of us here are believers, and most of us are more mature believers, you may think, well, I've already escaped all my sin. Okay, that, that doesn't mean that you're not going to be tempted to sin, right? Um, it does not mean that something's going to come up one day and you're going to have to make that choice. But you can know that the gospel gives you the power to escape sin. And I love, one thing I love about the power of the gospel is how it is so transformative. Andrew, I'm talking about transformers, buddy. <laughs> It's so transformative. You have people today who are constantly trying to transform themselves, right? Some women, you know, they wake up one way, and by the time they put their makeup on, they have transformed themselves too. So, but there are people trying to transform, I guess, basically who they are because they're not content, and they think that God messed up and made a mistake. And they're confused. They're, they're trying to, to transform to a different gender, all those different things. Um, the people are trying to transform their shape, all that stuff. But you know what, Andrew? God was the original transformer. He's been transforming people for two, almost 2,000 years. Because he's been making all of them into completely new creations. He's been transforming them from an old sin nature to a new nature where we are in Christ. And I think that is wonderful. It completely changes everything. So um, Romans 8, 2 through 4. This is another section, th these three verses in the next slide. These are some verses that I know I read growing up. I'm sure I did. But I don't ever know if I was ever taught some of these things. So, And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law couldn't do. He sent his own son, Jesus, in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body... God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son, kids, who is God's son? Jesus. Jesus, by giving Jesus as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirements of the law would be fully satisfied for us, who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. And then verse 12, Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. When I was, you know, all my life, it's always been, oh, no, we all sin. It's okay. Just confess it. And here in Romans, it actually tells you the opposite. It says, actually, you, have, you don't have to sin. You were born into sin, so you needed a redeemed. But after you are redeemed, after the power of the gospel comes and, it, and sets you free from the power of darkness and you have escaped sin, you don't have to. If you do, it's because you choose to. I was never, I was never taught that. It's like I've read that verse. But that's what it says. It says you have no obligation to do what your sinful desires um, to, uh, urge you to do. So sin has no power over the life of a believer. And there is no verse in the Bible that ever supports that sin has the power over us. Instead, we are told the opposite. We live in victory over sin. Because where is sin? It's under our feet. Why? Because we are connected to Christ. We are in him. He is in us. So we have the power to overcome. Whether it's this tiny lie that we think, oh, it's no big deal, it's just a little deception, or whether it's something major. We have the power to overcome it. So and we are told to not let sin control our bodies. And if we are told, hey, don't let it control you, that means that we have the power if it controls us or not. So action point for this first part of letter E is introspection. Look inside yourself, just like we did at communion. Take time to evaluate your life to really take the blinders off and really evaluate your life and repent for the things that need repenting. Um, growing up, Baptist, I think that was one thing that we were really big on was constantly repenting, which is good. I mean, that, that has helped me so much in life because it's like, no, I'm, 
I feel like I'm constantly trying to evaluate myself. Like, the Lord, is there any wicked way within me? Just like David prayed in Psalms. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Because I, I, want, I don't want anything to be in me that is not from the Lord. So remember, by the power of the Spirit, you can say goodbye once and for all to all that sin. No, like I said, you can't eliminate temptation. Um, but you can control if you give in because we have the power over sin. So don't get lost in the whole like, well, like I said, we all sin. Just confess it. No big deal. Have a high standard for yourself. Okay, God tells us, he says, be perfect as I am perfect. Be holy as I am holy. We can be like God in that regard. And he, uh, and our life is hidden with Christ, so he gives us those things. So the last part of letter E is the second part of that chapter in chapter 3. It says, uh, this is the power to exhort. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and exhorting one another with all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, all with grace in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So the power of the gospel, we said it, it transforms us. We escape sin, and after we escape sin, we can exhort one another. Like, that is why it's so important to be in church. I know I'm preaching, like, to the choir because you guys are here. <laughs> but that's why it's so important to be in church and to be connected to a group. That's one reason why I love hosting a Bible study on Wednesday mornings, okay? It's because it gives us time to come together and to exhort each other. I can't say that we sing psalms. Um, we don't really do that very often. But we're, we are admonishing one another with wisdom. We are, you know, we're encouraging one another. We're, we're teaching each other. And um, even like this last week, it's like I had, I had a topic I was bringing. And we talked about that for a couple minutes. But then, I mean, everybody brought something. I mean, it was like we all kind of went around and we were encouraging one another. And well, what do you think about this topic? And it gave us time to dive into the word. And that is why it's so important to be in a place, to have a group around you that you can exhort one another and to encourage one another. Um, and the gospel gives us the power to do that because it changes us. Because we aren't in that kingdom anymore. We are now, we have the mind of Christ. We can treat each other that way. All right, uh, oh, action points for this one. So 5.2, the first one was for the escape, 5.2. Look for ways to encourage and to exhort those around you, to encourage each other in the Lord. If you don't have a group you regularly meet with to get encouragement with and to, you know, to exhort one another, then, you know, get involved somewhere um, because we, we need each other. We all depend on the Lord, but the Lord has given us each other as his body to, um, to be able to do this very thing. All right, last point, letter L. This is the big one. The power to live out your calling. Okay, the power to live out your calling. When God saves us, he, he created us all with a purpose. There is nobody on this earth who is purposeless. Okay, we were all created with a purpose. And God knew it beforehand. It says, I think it's in Ephesians, that he created for good works that he established before the world was created. Okay, and the gospel gives us the power to live out our calling. Once again, we are meant to grow because he's transferred us out of the, uh, the power of darkness. We have, we have complete freedom over those false philosophies. We've escaped sin. We've exhort. Now let's live out our calling. So we're going to read a little bit about what Paul said about that. Chapter 4. Be devoted to prayer, keeping alert in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray for us too, that God may open a door for the message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I make it known as I should. Conduct yourself with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunities. And let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you should answer everyone. Oh, kiddos. It says, let your, conversa let your speech be gracious, seasoned with salt. Does that sound kind of funny? Is it? Uh, that's what I'm thinking. We just need to open our, is that saying open up our mouth and put salt on our mouth? It might help some people. You are right about that. Um, what? You what? Yeah. Okay. So here's the thing. When it talks about being, let your speech be gracious, seasoned with salt, it's not saying that we fill our mouths with salt, right? Okay. This is alluding to back in Matthew where he talks about salt having flavor. And if it gets shredded out, can you add flavor back to salt? No. It's talking about make sure that when you are saying things, that you're not saying just these worthless things, that the things that you are saying 
are seasoned with salt. They add flavor. They add meaning. They add purpose to these things. So, yeah, don't destroy it. So, um, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Um, so, once again, we have seen the power of the gospel. So, to me, the fact that our some future leaders are saying we don't want the gospel to go around the world. We don't want to evangelize people. We don't, in essence, we don't want them to live out their calling. It's like, oh, that's terrible. <laughs> you, you know, that's just very wrong because whether you are in business, whether you are in ministry, or whether you are a stay-at-home mom, or whatever your case may be, none of us are exempt from the kingdom of God mandate to go into the world and to make disciples. And even he, Paul is here. He said, hey, part of what I need you guys to do for me as the body pray for me. And as for Paul, he, he would say, he's like, pray that I make it known as I should, that I, that I live out my calling the way that I should. Okay, I have one final verse. And you may read this verse and think that's kind of a strange verse, but to me this was, uh, it was a very impactful verse. Colossians 4, 17. And tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the ministry you received in the Lord. And I'm saying the same thing to us. See to it that you finish the ministry you receive from the Lord. We would not have this admonishment. I know it's to Archippus, but it's included in the Bible. If we were not tempted to get lax, right? Just like the Bible says, don't grow weary in well-doing. We wouldn't be tempted to grow weary. We wouldn't tell us to not grow weary if we didn't get tempted to grow weary from time to time. So I want you to think, what are you called to do? Kiddos, you may not know what you're called to do yet, and that's okay. This is a time for you to pray and to figure it out. So, I'm going to get a little like specific. Mom, what are you called to do? I'll come back to you. Okay. <laughs> Dad, what are you called to do? All right. See to it that you complete the ministry that God gave you. Johnny, what are you called to do? Okay, see to it that you do what he does. Oh, I know, I know, I know, but I'm just saying, see to it that you're doing everything you can right now to be ready to take that and to do your own thing in the time being. All right, kids, Alana, you know what you're called to do? All right, you want to share? Okay, you have such an important calling. Like, it's really easy to say, okay, you preach, you preach to mostly Christians. Okay, the area that you're in is really dark. Like, really dark. But that's where the light shines. So, Alana, see to it that you complete the ministry you received in the Lord. Okay, you got a year and a half left. Okay, and some of those people you may not see again. Right? So, be that light the whole time. All right, Lisa, what are you called to? I almost warned you about this the other night, but... I decided not to. Okay. All right. You ready yet, Grandma? Okay. Back to you, Mom. What are you called to do? Okay. So I'd like the same thing I do. I support him. All right. And See to it. It's okay. I already, I already said I thought you were sitting there first, and I said, well, I know what we're supposed to do. You think we're supposed to do. All right. See to it that you complete the ministry you received in the Lord. For you, see to it that you, have com you complete the ministry you received in the Lord. All right. Who wants to go first? Carrie. Carrie. Well, there you go. I'm out of memory. <laughs> You're a builder, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. All right, Mr. Gary, see to it that you complete the ministry that God has put in you. Dana, what are you called to? To be an evangelist, to raise disciples, doing every day. Right, I hear you on that one. <laughs> Right. All right. Well, see to it that you complete the ministry that you have received in the Lord. 
And even for myself, it's like, what am I called to do? And it's like, well, I think, I, I, I know I am called to teach and to, to preach and to share the gospel. And it's like, okay, even for me, it's like, okay, yes, you're in a season of life where I am raising kids and yeah, making those, those disciples and training them up in the way that they should go. But even then, like, Lord, how do I complete my calling in all facets? It's not like God's like, you can just take a break until they're old enough. It's like, no, 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 no. I have to show them by my actions. Like, hey, hey, here's how you walk out what the Lord has called you to do. And so for me, it's really easy. It's like you can keep, you can look at it one way and say, well, nobody's knocked on my door to come ask me to teach yet. Where is I check the, check the mail every day? You know, okay, well, you can look at it that way or you can say, Lord, you've told me to do this. I'm going to do everything in my power to do everything that I can to make sure that I am fulfilling the ministry that you told me to do. And um, so that's what I think about. Like, what are the things that are stopping you? Like, is it time? Is it your feelings? Like, are, is it intimidating? I mean, because I mean, I understand it can be intimidating. Identify what those things are. Okay. I know um, not to point you out even more, Lana, but for you, it's like, it's, you know, you're in that dark spot. It's like, you gotta, you may have to really know your stuff in order to, to share, but it's like, whatever that, that obstacle in your mind is that, that might, or even just temporarily kind of flare up to keep you from doing that, identify it and then solve the problem. Okay. If you need, you know, if you need more education in a matter, well then, Hey, talk to the people around you, make sure you're getting good resources, prepare yourself for it. You know, like for us, we've talked about feeling called to teach. It's like, well, we have a camera, you know, we have some microphones. Well, everybody else is on YouTube, so why not us? Why not do everything that we can to make sure that we are, are fulfilling our calling? And so that's when, um, that's something I want to say for this week. Um, oh, hang on, let me do this. Good. Okay. I want you to pray and ask the Lord. Not necessarily just come up with your own ideas, but pray and ask the Lord, like, Lord, what can I do this week to help me to move forward? Your gospel gives me the power to live out my calling. I'm sorry, ignore this. I forgot to change that. Anyway, so what can I do this week in order to, to move forward in my calling? And um, just in, in closing, I'm going to leave you with a couple of, couple of quotes. Do you, you guys know who William Carey is? Figured you might know. <laughs> yeah, um, William Carey. He was uh, William Carey was a missionary in the late 1700s and the early 1800s. He went against the Church of England and he uh, joined a Baptist church. And he was a missionary. He was actually for the most part I was right. It was to India, and he went to India in the late 1700s and early 1800s. Do you know who was waiting for him in India? Not an organization nobody the heathen as he called it and that was it he and his family loaded up on a boat and traveled all the way to india not really knowing not having necessarily a sending institution he was creating it as he went because he said he was like okay well i'm just gonna go can you imagine like going to a land where like you, once again you don't have it you're not able to phone home you don't you can't order from sam's online have this delivered to india okay An extra toilet paper you can't do that. You know, he didn't know what he was getting into. He goes over to India. He actually helped establish the first like Baptist missions in uh, I like the Baptist mission board in that area. And I want to leave you with a couple of quotes from him if I go the right way. There it is. So William Carey, missionary to India, he says, expect great things from God and attempt great things from God. So for what you are called to do, expect God to do great things, but also don't relax. Don't just think like, okay, I'm just going to chill. I'm going to keep stay at that one talent level. No, no, no. Attempt great things. Think of yourself as that 10 talent servant who's like, I'm putting everything I can into this. And this is the last quote from him. Surely it is worthwhile to lay ourselves out with all our might and promoting the cause and the kingdom of Christ. So even him after, after sacrificing everything said, yeah, it's worthwhile to completely commit ourselves and to completely devote ourselves to the kingdom of Christ. And that is my, that, that, I guess that is my message for today, that for us as a group, it is worthwhile for us to put everything that we can into promoting the cause of the kingdom of Christ for ourselves personally, but for those around us. Because yeah, we're in Cleveland. Yeah, there's a lot of churches, but there are still people who need to know the Lord. 
There are people on the internet who still need to know the Lord. There are people all over the world who need the Lord. And you never know what your decisions and what your calling is going to lead to. You may think, oh, I'm just in Cleveland now, or I'm just in Dalton now. But you don't know where your talents are going to take you. You don't know where it's going to take you. You could end up across the world. You could end up in movies and shows that are aired everywhere. You could end up being having videos played everywhere. You never know. And that's why it's important that we have that foundation of the gospel and its power so we can live our life according to his word. All right, let's pray, and then I'll hand it back to you. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you so much for your word. Father, I thank you for the gospel and how it gives us the power, Father, to live out our calling. Father, and that we can do it confidently, Lord, because we are connected with you, and because we are connected with you, all those other things are under our feet. So we can walk into whatever circumstance with confidence, Lord, knowing that the powers of darkness are under our feet. We can walk in confidence knowing that you have gifted us and that you have created us for this time and for this purpose. And Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for your word. And Father, we just bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.